This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Luis, uh, who I know for a very long while. Um, those are, who don't know him, uh, Luis uh, got his PhD in history from the Colegio de Mexico, and he made the usual scene. He studied with economics, but moved to history, and that has redeemed him. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I knew Luis through Carlos Marichal when I landed in Mexico City, uh, trying to make sense of some research money I had. And uh, Carlos introduced uh, Luis to me as really the expert or somebody who knows a lot about fiscal history and political economy of 19th century Mexico. Uh, he has written a number of articles and edited volumes and uh, authored books and stuff, uh, particularly on the subject. But these last 10 years he has been out of the game as the director of the Instituto Mora, from where he's taken like, the detox uh, many uh, trip in in London these days to put behind like few politicians do in Mexico your political past. So uh, he took this invitation to discuss ideas he he's toying with uh, for this new book at some point, and has this title about new consider oh, new considerations behind the fiscal failure of the first Mexican Republic, 1824-1837. And uh, despite the very uh, unsexy title, it is very much a, a topic that uh, any Mexican historian knows um, about the relations between the province of the states and the federal states. Luis? Yes, thank you, Alejandra, and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk to you is. Uh, you know, present a, a framework for a large uh, research project that I've been working on. And it's, uh, I consider it a two-pronged project, large project. First, I, I, I tried to discuss with a recent book uh, published by Juan Carlos Garavaglia and Juan Pro uh, on the, the state formation in Latin America, the intention of incorporating state formation in Latin America into a more general discussion uh, related with the construction of a theory of state formation, or related with the theories of state formation, whatever, whatever these are. And in this book, they have, uh, they have this study on Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Guatemala. And uh, they, they want, in this book, they, they, the, the intention is to give a historical perspective more than a sociological perspective around the, the construction of, of, the, of, of Latin American states. And uh, uh, my, my contribution to this, to this discussion is the historic, the, the Mexican case, the Mexican case in Latin America, which is is in certain ways special, like uh, you know, Costa Rica built its fiscal uh, administration through the tobacco uh, monopoly, or uh, Colombia, Colombia built it around the postal offices. Well, Mexico is is special for several reasons, I think. First, um, it had a a big solid. Uh, colonial administration. It was the flagship of the Spanish Empire, the flagship uh, territory of the Spanish Empire. Uh, that uh, structure fragmented itself firstly with the uh, Bourbon reforms and then with the wars, the 11 years of the wars of independence. And as a nation, Mexico ended as a federal republic. Because of this, Mexico ended being a federal republic after two years of of accommodation with, you know, military uh, powers and bureaucratic powers and elites in general, it finally became a republic in 1824. That was uh, uh, Mexico became totally independent from Spain in 1821, and in 1824 it became a federal republic. The model for for Mexico's federal republic was not an exact copy the United States. Uh, with uh, this administration, 
uh, the administration that that Mexico built it, it was a it was a, a compromise uh, uh, that the administration that Mexico built uh, uh, came from a group of politicians that that were part of the Mexican government in in 1823 1824 and uh, had uh, the, Mexico was able to how would we say it uh, Mexico power in, with a seat in Mexico City would be able to put uh, bureaucrats in all the territory, a very large territory, uh, three type of bureaucrats, the civil servant, the military, and post offices. This is, the, 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 the latter post office uh, service has not been, been studied at all. Uh, the military have, have, have been studied, but more on the uh, social uh, basis of, of the military, a little on the, on the workings of the military, but mostly on, on the social basis. And what I intend to do in this project is to study precisely the fiscal, the financial uh, functionary, uh, the financial bureaucrat of, of Mexico, of the Republic of Mexico, under the orders of Mexico City government. This was the federal government. Ge the historiography generally calls it general government, federal government, but not central government because after 1835, we have a central republic and it, 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 it causes some con confusion, you know, to, to, so we have to be very careful about that. Okay, the second part of the project, and it's what I'm gonna talk to you about today, is um, a new perspective on a problem that has been studied by many colleagues, me, me, and my, me myself, and many, many colleagues uh, amongst them, uh, Marcello Carmagnani, Barbara Tenenbaum, Carlos Marichal, Jose Antonio Serrano, um, Jesus Hernandez Jaimes, recently uh, uh, for about 30 years, we have been studying the performance of Mexico's finances in this first uh, republic, the first federal republic that goes from 1824 to 1825. 35, pardon, uh, excuse me, uh, 1837 is because the Comisarios Generales, which are these uh, bureaucrats, these civil servants, they were not called at the time civil servants, but I call them civil servants, uh, were eliminated in 1837. Okay, the purpose of my project is to discuss, maybe question, the idea that the collapse of the first Mexican Republic uh, was a result of federal and state finances uh, from the perspective of, from a financial perspective, from an economic perspective, not, not from an administrative per, per administration uh, point of view. Okay, until now, the studies have concentrated mainly it's on, the, on, on government data, on, on federal government data, on federal government information. Specifically, the Ministry of Finance reports to Congress, of which Mexico has an almost consistent series from 1824 to 1977. These reports have a, a considerable amount of statistical and qualitative information related with the income, expenditure, and debts of federal governments uh, during the period of federal republics and of central governments during the period, the, the, the short periods or, or few periods of uh, central republics, centralist republics. Um, uh, what, what I intend to do is not to look, not to look specifically at these uh, 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 reports, I intend to look at the, the state information generated in the states and that were sent to Mexico City uh, periodically. Um, this, these, this information uh, was uh, inventoried by, by, by me and, and, and a group of, of colleagues, some 300 boxes of books and documents in the Mexico City Archive, in, in the Archivo General de la Nación, uh, and it's called Comisarias Generales. That's the name. It was not, uh, being a federation, it was not a document that was 
taken from the state treasury or from a, an office in the States <coughs> and brought to Mexico City. In reality, is uh, the, the, the documents that were requested by the Departamento de Cuenta y Razón, which is a, an accounting department under the Ministry of Finance, to analyze these documents. So, so the origin of those documents is, is truly the, the, the states, but the, the original destiny of those documents was the Ministry of Finance in Mexico City. In Mexico City. Um, this, uh, this, th th these documents concentrate mainly on the first half of the Federal Republic, that is 1824-1832. Because that was a time when this departamento, this department of accounting, uh, audited the, 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 these books, these accounting books and documents that were generated in the Comisarias Generales. They were called Comisarias Generales. Um, in the second part of the, of the Federal Republic, these, uh, th this department did not exist. They left the, the task of auditing the, the books to Congress. Uh, Congress didn't do it, but in the law, that's what they were supposed to do. Okay, they still, they still do. Okay, the Comisarias Generales were the offices of the Federation in each of the states of the New Republic. The Comisario was the officer. According to the law, it was aided by a treasurer, an accountant, and several, several under Comisarios and post office workers located in places removed from the state capital. There was a uh, hierarchical organization in the comisarios according to the amount of money they collected or the amount of money they were supposed to collect from the state. All the comisaria organization uh, depended on the federal treasury. They were civil servants, like, uh, like I said, but they were not called like that at the time. And I have uh, done a, a first uh, a exploratory analysis of one comisaria, a simple one. And this is a comisaria of the state of Nuevo León in the northeastern part of Mexico. At the time, Mexico went way far farther north. And uh, why, why, this is a called the, the, the internal northeastern states, they were called. And it included Tamaulipas, which is on the, co on the coast, Nuevo León, which is the, the, the one that I had circled in, in red, and Coahuila, Texas. At the time, it was one single state, the state of Coahuila and Texas. Why Nuevo León? Nuevo León has that geographical, it looks like a, like a diamond. You can't see it very, very clear in that map, but it looks like a diamond. It's had that since 16th century, so in the late 16th century. It has uh, a very solid, since the, almost since the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, a very solid capital city, Monterrey. Uh, it is. Uh, it has. Uh, it is has several uh, uh, city towns, towns with the town council. And uh, it was uh, it, it, in the late colony. It was uh, the seat of the commander of uh, the provincias internas, of the internal provinces. North, northeastern internal provinces and is the siege of a diocese. A diocese that comprises Coahuila, Texas, Tamaulipas, and Nuevo León. Tamaulipas is, uh, is a state, it was a state at the time, as of 1824, that had not a very definite capital city and, uh, and, and it's, it's very long, which, which is very difficult to, to control militarily. Texas is too big. To Texas, uh, Coahuila and Texas is definitely too big. Uh, and, and it had uh, also political problems of as to where, where to, 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 to position the, the capital city, Saltillo or Monclova. This was during all the Federal Republic. So I chose Nuevo León because it's because I was born in Monterrey. Well, no, really, it's just a personal matter also. Okay. Um, the Comisarios is, are, in my opinion, one of the most eloquent aspects of the optimism of Mexican elites in the adoption of a re Republican and federal mode of government for the following reasons. 
first. When they created this figure, they gave them good salaries, uh, a percentage of resource collection. Not at the beginning. At the beginning, they took what they paid in the late uh, colonial period to the intendentes. In fact, the first comisarios were, or, or in the law, the first comisarios were the 12 original intendencies of New Spain. Uh, after 1831, they were paid a percentage of what they collected, which uh, turned out to be quite a lot of money. That's why I say it was like an optimistic, like an optimist view. They gave them a great amount of power, and that is the power of the purse at the state level. I, I'm not, I don't mean the state treasury level, I mean the state federal uh, 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 aspects of, 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 of the state, of, of the state operation. Uh, because, especially because the rules of establishment of the Comisarios, which is a, an early law of 1824, uh, uh, stated that in case of emergency they could spend money on the conditions of giving notice immediately without having to have an author authorization, for, authorization from the federal treasury in Mexico City. They could do it their own volition, which m meant a lot of power. And third, uh, this was like very, the optimism of, of, of those people, they gave the Comisario a huge workload. And they thought that they were able to do it. That's part of what I, why I call it optimism. Um, they were expected uh, to keep accounting books, monthly cash accounts, inventories of tobacco and gunpowder and sealed paper, monopolies that remain in the hands of federal government, the hiring of assistants, the gathering of statistical and geographical information, monthly military reviews, payments, quarters, supplies, arms, munitions, castles, fortresses, as well as maintaining a good and diplomatic relation with state authorities. It was very similar, the, the, all these tasks were very similar to the, the ones that the, the, intendant, the intendente had, but the intendente had treasure, had, a, had the caja, the caja real. The comisario was in itself the caja, and Monterrey there was not a treasurer or an accountant. He had to, in any case, to hire them out of his own pocket if he couldn't comply with what, what the, the guidelines said. Uh, the comisarios were the tax collectors of the Federation. The next question is, but who were the taxpayers? This brings me to discuss the characteristics of that first Mexican federalism. The Mexican, federal, the Mexican federalism was founded on a on a charter, 1824 charter, that created the Federation. It was called the Acta Constitutiva de la Federación. This was January of 1824. And since the beginning, they, they discussed uh, the, what, what Congress could do in, in terms of taxes. Uh, the first idea was to sustain, was, and I quote, sustain the proportional equality of obligations and rights that the states should have before the law. Of course, this brought upon different opinions that had to do mainly with uh, the equality, propor proportional equality of rights and obligations. The, 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 the very day that the Acta was published, this was in, 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 in late January 1824, <coughs> this this group of the, that that became that later became a, a constituent congress discussed Article Thirteen of the project of of of, of the the act that was stipulated that general congress had the power to establish the necessary contributions to cover the general expenses of the republic, determine their use, and make the executive accountable for it. This also brought upon uh, different opinions in relation to how much Congress had authority into the state, the state uh, fiscal apparatus. And uh, 
uh, uh, one of the deputies, uh, the one from the state of Mexico, said that the, suggested that the uh, Congress should only have state monopolies and customs revenues <coughs> for the payment of general expenses, and the rest would have to go to the states. At the end, the Acta has a, a somewhat ambiguous position in its, in its article, and it said that Congress would not tax the states was, but was left in the possibility to do so in case of emergency. This meant the following proposal. This is, I'm, I'm sorry if this is in Spanish. If you have any problem, I can, I can help you. This was the, the project, but it ended in, in, in the law. Several, no, this is the law, 4th of August, 1824. And this is how it was allocated, the, the resource, the fiscal resources of general government were allocated into the Federation on the left and the states in the right. The Federation kept all these very small, not all of them were small, very small uh, income sources like uh, uh, customs, maritime customs, the uh, duties on, on imports, a 50% duty on several imports, uh, of course all the monopolies, uh, tobacco, uh, gunpowder, post office, lottery, salt mines, uh, uh, territories, there were two territories in, in that federation, the properties that, that had belonged in the 18th century to the Inquisition and to the Jesuits, which is called Bienes de la Inquisición and Temporalidades, and after all that, all, all, the, all, all those sources of income, if you take away the expenses of the Federation at that time, or according to that experiment, they did. A deficit came out of three million pesos. That deficit was to be covered by a special tax that was called the contingente. The contingente, like its name says, it was a very contingent amount of money because it depended on the deficit. That meant it was supposed, the idea was to, to create a, a tax that would be a portion among the states of the Republic, 18 states of the Republic, so that each would pay according to uh, tithe collection, uh, population, and the effects of the War of Independence on the territory. The rest of the sources of the of the general government, of fiscal financial sources of the general government in 1924 were apportioned to the states. This was a residual. It was the, the law does not say these belong to the states. This is a residual. They, they, they just, the law just says these belong to the federations, the federation, the rest belong to the states. Okay? That, was, that was to be important because uh, there would be a lot of, of complaints uh, from the states. The, the first complaint came from the legislator of the state of Jalisco, which is a very rich state. It was a very uh, pro-sovereign state, uh, uh, in, wanted a, a, a big independence. And the legis that, that legislator, legislature complained that all incomes, all of them, and their administration should belong to the states. And the argument for this was quite solid. If General Congress only levied state taxes on the states, on the, each state, it was implicitly resigning to tax individuals. Otherwise, the system would be nominal, which would, in fact, make for a centralist republic. That was the argument of the legislature of uh, Jalisco. The response from the commission, the, the Finance Commission of General Congress, was that the project was not only the federal acta, the, the one from January of 1824, that gave power to General Congress to pass laws and decrees to sustain the proportional equality of obligations and rights that the states could have, should have before the law, but also the United States Constitution. Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. That's all it says, the, the American Constitution, that's all it says. 
and they had both be, both been used this is the commission in their full extent they would have the, if they had been used in their full extent they would have served they would have served congress to extend even more fiscal faculties over the federation the answer was jalisco the legislature of jalisco should be grateful for the greater financial freedom it was given all this and this kind of quieted down uh, the state of jalisco um, the contingente which is a what the amount of contingente ever collected in the federal republic turned out to be like 10% of all federal income so it was a very small amount a relatively relatively small amount what made it important and what has been the the study of, of of many colleagues was the fact that it represented the sovereignty of the states it represented their independence and the the peace uh, with which they were to negotiate that independence and sovereignty in front of the federal government uh, whatever the 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 contingente became afterwards i'll, I'll talk about it in a, in a short while i think this 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 law the 4th of august of 1824 and uh, some 10 laws and, and decrees uh, that came out between this date and March, April of 1826 are, in my opinion, one of the most important institutional changes in 19th century Mexico because it created from scrap a new system. It, it, it made a tabula rasa out of colonial and fiscal administration and instituted a new a new form of administration a new system of administration uh, an administration a fiscal a fina financial fiscal administration that was in accordance with a federal form form of government all public finance decisions were to be taken by the ministry of finance which is an inheritance of the spanish administration it was a ministry a secretary of Finance. There's no translation to English of the word Hacienda, but it was the Ministry of Hacienda. Uh, uh, it was a, a, a early, early 18th century uh, uh, discussion. Um, colonial accounting offices, the individual colonial accounting offices were eliminated and concentrated in a central department of accounts. El Departamento de Puente Razón, the one that, that, that I was mentioning a while ago. And perhaps pursuant of the idea of accountability, this department would evaluate the precision and legality of all federal accounts. And why do I say per per perhaps? Because, and this is, this is another uh, other issue completely, the, the system of accounts, the, the old system of accounts, was more worried of accountability of the of the servant of the king's servant than uh, uh, the other the, the double entry type of account uh, uh, the, the the type of, of accounting of, of this period is called the single single entry account it's it's very similar to the way one keeps accounts at home the charge is what was uh, uh, what came in and the discharge is what went out, but it has to be proven with, it has to have a paper. As it, that, that's why the, 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 <clears throat> the place where all these, all these documents are is it, very large and 300 boxes, a big boxes, I don't mean small boxes, one of those huge boxes, because it's full of these little uh, papers that, that, you know, they give account of, of what, where the money went. Um, also important is the creation of the general treasury, a federal treasury, which concentrated all incomes, virtual and literal incomes, uh, gave count, get, t took account of expenditures, uh, uh, and the, 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 the purpose, of course, this is, this is an aspiration, this is not uh, what it really was, it still isn't. The purpose is to administer for Mexico City all federal income and expenditure. 
The, the, there was a, a treasury, a general treasury in Mexico City in colonial times, but this treasury concentrated all civil and military expenses, incomes and expenses, for particular expenditures. Uh, uh, because uh, the, the, the colonial treasury had, had two divisions, so there were two treasuries, one for civil expenditures and the other one for military, for military ones. Um, the treasury had under its uh, uh, orders uh, a 19 of 19 states, uh, the Comisarias Generales. They were not all Comisarias Generales, some were general Comisarias, other were under Comisarias. Uh, depending, like I said, on the amount of money they managed. The, uh, the, the distribution of resources from the Federation to the states become, be, uh, began in late 1824. This was not a literal distribution. This was the opening of books. Each comisaria started opening the book. And the, uh, its, its own books. There were, there were two books, two main books. Um, these books would consider the, the first, the first uh, item of these books was consider the accounts receivable in favor of general government until they were all settled. So, the, so if you open the book, the first, the first book, you see that. The second aspect uh, of the relationship between states and federation is, uh, is something that has been overlooked by all of us for many years, and it's the items Bienes de la Inquisición y Temporalidades. This is like um, national, federal real estate. And uh, it belonged to the king. It belonged to the king when the, when the Jesuits were uh, expunged from, the, from New Spain. It belonged to the king when the Inquisición was eliminated. The Inquisition was eliminated, I think it was in 1814 or 1815. And this uh, comprised uh, uh, land, huge tracts of land, especially in the north, but also several buildings. And one of those buildings was an old church that Arredondo, who had been commander general of, of internal provinces in, in, in Monterrey, precisely, uh, expropriated from the, from the Temporalidades Fund to build the quarter general headquarters of his commandancy. Uh, when Nuevo León became part of the Federation, that building, which had been repaired by Arredondo in, in 1817, 1819, um, that building became the house of the legislature. That was money that had to be paid by the state to the Federation. The problem came up uh, somewhere in 1829, several years afterwards, but it's it's important to take into account, into account, not because Monterrey had that, that, that problem, that was a small problem, something like 10,000 pesos, which was a lot for, for Nuevo León, but because other states had much more uh, buildings and land and that, that the states uh, pretended to become owners of, of this land and, and without giving account of it. No, that didn't work that way. Uh, the third main issue of the relationship between states and federation is the contingente, precisely, and the, oh, where is, where is it, where is it, okay, it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be there, oh, the tobacco, tobacco activities, the tobacco was a, tobacco was a monopoly, it was a very, very profitable monopoly, perhaps the most profitable source of income the king of Spain had in New Spain after uh, uh, taxes on, on silver, tobacco. This is after 18, 1760 until the, the last days of, of colonial period. When the Federation uh, 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 discussed what to do with, with the tobacco monopoly, it split it in half, well not in half, split it in two. Uh, one part, the production uh, and cultivation of tobacco, which was circumscribed to certain areas of the state of Veracruz, belonged to the Federation. The Federation was to distribute the tobacco leaf all over the Republic. <coughs> and the states would buy this tobacco, pay the Federation, and process it into cigarettes or cigars or snuff or whatever, whatever people used at the time. But it was still a, a, a very... 
everybody looked at it as, as a very profitable activity, a very profitable source of public income. And this problem would remain until the Civil War in 1863-64, Mexican Civil War until 1862-63-64, because it, they still had this idea that it could be recovered from its past glories in the, uh, during the colonial period without considering that uh, Mexico had very little control over its, its uh, coasts and a lot of tobacco came in from Cuba and Virginia. In fact, most of the tobacco that was sold in Nuevo Leon was from, from the state of Virginia because it's, it was better. The tobacco that was distributed by the Federation, especially to the northern states, was, was bad tobacco. It, was, it came out to be not, not, not good. <laughs> okay. Um, this is the contingente as a proposal from the, uh, the Finance Committee. This was what came out to be in the law, finally. As you can see, uh, we still have these clusters of state, Estado del Norte, which included Chihuahua, Durango, New Mexico, uh, Estado del Occidente, which included Sinaloa, Sinaloa, Baja California, and the uh, higher ca upper California, and Estado del Oriente, which included Coahuila, Texas, and Nuevo León. Nuevo León had to pay uh, 18,750 pesos a year, which was not, it was one of the smallest amounts of, of, of contingente. Uh, they did not complain the allotment, but they were not able to pay. Of course, it, I'm talking of Nuevo León because this is what I've, what I've been looking at. But this probably happened in many states. They were not able to pay because they didn't have their fiscal offices settled immediately. They couldn't, they couldn't get you know, personnel or offices or how, how to collect taxes. So it did not pay for 24 months. So, so the debt was continuously accumulating. Even, be, be, even if, if, if it had a discount, the first year it had a 50% discount and the second year it had a one-third discount, etc. It was still accumulating. How did the state do in these first months? They took advantage of a gap of the law, uh, a, gap, a, a gap of the law of, of, the, of the 4th of August law, which is that the Mexican government, government had not signed the patronato uh, with uh, Rome, the patronage with Rome. The patronato that the, the Pope had signed for many, many centuries, I don't know if centuries, but about more than two centuries at least, with, with the King of Spain that said that part of the tithe collection belonged to the King. This signature had not been attained because Spain was part of the Holy Alliance and Rome didn't want to have problems with Spain, so they didn't sign the patronage or the patronato with Mexico. So there was nothing... Who, who was the owner of those monies? The law had a gap there, and they decided that the owners were the states, each state, but there was a problem. The dioceses it comprised several states. Nuevo León had Coahuila, Texas, Tamaulipas, and Nuevo León. Uh, Guadalajara had Zacatecas, Durango, a, 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 a part of Michoacán. So there was a, a, a big problem. Nuevo León had no, no difficulty because Monterrey was the seat of the, of the diocese and the, the box, the, the cash box was there. So payments came from the church. Payment, the first contingente payments for Nuevo León came from the church. In fact, the, Nuevo León had to pay 114,000 pesos during all the Federal Republic of contingente to the Federation. Of those 114,000 pesos, uh, 17 were paid by the church, by the Cathedral Council, by the Monterrey Cathedral Council. 2,000 pesos were paid in horses and saddles. In August of 1829, when the coast of Mexico was threatened to no avail by the Spanish ships and troops of Isidro Barradas 
in, in a, an intention to reconquer Mexico, uh, which says a lot of the, of the capacity of financial recuperation of the treasury of Nuevo León. Uh, that's that, I, I haven't I haven't seen I, have, I haven't had available the, the, the all the the information about uh, Nuevo León's and I mean the, the 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 state treasury not not the not the federal comisaria uh, capacity to to pay but what I know is that Nuevo León paid all the contingente that was assigned to it it paid all the debt of tobacco debt, which was a lot. It, it turned out to be like, I don't know, some 50,000 pesos. The repairs of the legislative house, like I said, it was 10,000 pesos. And one or two loans that, that were uh, 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 required by the Federation in 1829 in, in view of the, of the Spanish invasion. Uh, of course, this this means that that Nuevo León really and and if Nuevo León did it, probably all of the states were able to do it. Uh, but uh, okay, the, these are these are the, the Nuevo León's sources of income. This is the state income. Like you see, they're they're all very small. There there there's the Alcabala somewhere in Journal Customs. That's fourteen point five percent. There's a direct contribution, the 21%, 20.6%. And that's it. The rest are, are well, okay, the, the consumption duties on imported goods. There were, there were a lot of imported goods. More than what it says there because most of the, m most of the imported goods were, were smuggled in. But it had a really weak uh, uh, fiscal construction. And this was not new. This was inherited from the colonial period. Or the allotment of of of, country, of 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 taxes in 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 1824 but but look land grants and livestock license it was it was a, a very primitive financial structure the question is if they if they were able to pay all these debts this really worked that's my, my hypothesis because I don't have the I don't have the information. I just have eighteen twenty six. That's a, that's a only what I have. In opposition to 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 this is the fact that many of these taxes were once and for all taxes, tithes that are not there because they they, they belong to, to the cathedral chapter. Uh, they were not collected yearly. They were collected every few years, and they were collected in in products in foodstuffs and they had to be sold to become money and money is is what finally what the federation took uh, or at least that's what i think the, uh, the accounts uh, reflect uh, what 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 i can what 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 leads me to think that maybe there there, there was a, a an economic recovery of the state of Nuevo León, and if it was an re economic recovery of the state of Nuevo León, there, there was an economic recovery of at least the north of Mexico in the last years, in the last 1820s of the 19th century. Now, did the comisarios have anything to do with this, with these and other payments? They definitely. Not only did they uh, constantly press the governor for payment, of both the contingente and tobacco purchases, they are the ones until 1831 that carried the whole of the payment accounts. I haven't known, let alone found, one book of the state of Nuevo Leon, or one paper of the state of Nuevo Leon that even mentions uh, account keeping of what they paid to the Federation. They left this task completely to the Comisario. At least, no, not at least, until 1832. Okay, there was, um, <coughs> there was, a, more specifically, there was a Comisario. His name was Pedro Gomez. He had been what, what I call the Alcabalero, the one who took 
the, the customs official, the internal customs official. So he had experience. Not only had experience, he was a very good accountant. He, he, he had, his books were very clear. I don't know if, 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 if they're true, but, but they're very, very clear, and all his accounts are, are very clear. Uh, he's part of a Federalist liberal group. He disappeared for a while from the Comisaria during the Bustamante administration, which was not, it, there, there have been questions about if it was federal or, or more, more centralist. This was, the Bustamante administration was between 1830 and 1832, 1833. He returned to the Comisaria after the death of uh, the second Comisario, Trinidad de Arrese, in 1833. I think Gomez is a clear example of a good comisario. He kept clean accounts and apparently he was never questioned. And Nuevo León was one of the five states that paid contingente. Have you seen that? No, Chihuahua, Chihuahua. With that, with that. I don't believe that, that <laughs> those figures of Chihuahua because Chihuahua is too far. But Chihuahua paid 165% of the contingente allotted to it. Zacatecas, which was the richest state in the Republic, paid 110%. Nuevo León paid 110%. I think it's a, a little bit exaggerated. 100 and 100%. Leave it at that. Durango, Veracruz, Mexico, Estado de México, which is Mexico. Guanajuato, but practically all of them, some of them were had a very bad grade in that, in that contribution. This is this table. I did not build this table. This is this is Jesus Hernandez Jaimes, which is a very, a very good historian who, who does these things. Um, he's about Nuevo León was the one, one of the five states that paid contingente. If you add all the ones who paid around ninety something percent, you have seven states who paid the contingente debts. The tobacco debt in Nuevo León was also paid, but at a slower <coughs> rate. By the middle of 1830, the accounts payable to the Federation were much reduced, which means that the, the state had been pay, paying more, in relation to former years. This meant two things. Either the state was buying less tobacco, tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, enough, whatever they had to buy, than before, or was paying faster the purchases of the product. It was probably a combination of both, but mostly it was buying less because they were smuggling tobacco from the newly opened, legalized port of Matamoros, Tamaulipas, which, which is like some 300 miles from Monterrey. That's the tobacco debt. It goes from 1929, from, from 42 to 41, 31, 60. Uh, it, was, it was diminishing uh, rapidly. Uh, Pedro Gomez, who came back to the Comisaria, enjoyed a few months or more of a good salary because he was collecting uh, 3% of what he was, he was having as a salary, 3% of what he collected. This meant around 500 pesos monthly. 500 pesos monthly. Intendentes in Spain earned 4,000 pesos a year which is quite a lot of money. This didn't last. Definitely it didn't last. Because there was, there came a law that, 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 that changed everything. Uh, and he also had to adapt, not only was he earning more, he had to adapt to a new job description. Because the law changed. All the laws, all these laws that I've been talking about changed after what, what, is, what is called the, the, the Forgotten Revolution. The Forgotten Revolution was the rebellions in practically all the republic of, uh, of the generals against the administration of Anastasio Bustamante, Lucas Alamán, because they wanted to implement a more federal, a, a, a true federal republic and not a mock federal republic like, like they said. It was, a, it was a real revolution. And the state had to... Uh, uh, spend on uh, military uh, military uh, uh, issues uh, 
for example, these, these are incomes, cargos. Cargos mean incomes. The main income of the comisaria in 1827-28 was otras comisarias. This is transfers from one <laughs> comisaria to the other. Which means, why Monterrey? Because Monterrey was the most, <coughs> more, probably a more stable comisaria than the other two. Uh, yeah, and it was not a general comisaria. Monterrey. The second uh, item was contingente, and the third was the back. In 1832-33, the largest is Otras Comisarias, specifically the Matamoros Comisaria, which, was, which is a customs house in, in the port of Matamoros, which, which had to be open because it was, the smuggling was scandalous coming from, from there. And the, the surplus from the period, previous period, which is money that was not spent, it was not collected, it was not collected by the ones who were supposed to collect it from the Comisaria, mainly military personnel. And the third is the contingent. If we look at the graph for 1833-34, this is just half a year. It's all surplus and transfers. At the end of the federal period, it's all transfers <coughs> and that's all. The Comisaria, all, all, all the Comisaria, all, all Monterrey, the Comisaria Nuevo León became an office that would just move money from the two customs houses in Matamoros, the new one, and Tampico, the old one, and distributed, to, distributed it to the military outpost in Lampazos de Naranjo, which was an old presidio, Rio Grande, Babia, Santa Rosa, and I don't remember what's the other one, which were all old presidios, old colonial presidios, which became federal, federal military outposts. And what started in 1826-27, these are, these are cargos, these are all incomes, these are the expenditures. Uh, there's, the expenditures are also other comisarias, which means uh, transfers. Lampasos, there's Lampasos, there's a big expenditure there. Uh, local militia, that's the third one. And uh, uh, local militia, uh, uh, mounted militia. This is in 1829-1830. This is in 1833-34. You have the Compañía Presidial in, in Lampasos in first place. You have the, the, the Division General, the g big general, Manuel Mieriterán, in second place. And at the end of the federal period, all of it goes to the Texas question. Because it was, they, were, they were building up a military uh, force to recuperate Texas, which started to secede in 1826. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, a lot of uh, timing. Font. Ooh, that's even smaller. Um, any funny or any question? I have a few, but I'm going to jump in. Um, I'm mystified by one of the tables that you showed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, why these people would pay? I mean, for the many states, why would these people pay more than they are asked to pay? Or they were requested. So you have a table that you did not do. It's some somebody else's table, but you have some some uh, districts that they pay more of the contingent over a period of time than they were requested. Or I misunderstood that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was not talking. Uh, why would a state pay more? There are a few states that they a pay few more states pay than they more were requested than requested. So well, the case of Nuevo León, uh, that's, that's oh, well, what I... Well, Chihuahua or Zacatecas, yes, they pay yes, yes, more yes, than they, are, yes. they were required. Because the states, they were very, uh, they were very smart. They're, they were all smart people. Uh, the Zacatecas, for example, that's the case I know. There was a big rebellion in 
in Chihuahua, and there was there was no military resource to quell it. So Zacatecas used its internal militia, its provincial militia, to uh, uh, quell the rebellion in Chihuahua. This was taken into account of the contingent, what was called the Buena Cuenta, a Buena Cuenta. The contingent yeah, but that in fact is a subsidy from Zacatecas to Chihuahua in which the No, a Zacatecas to the Federation yeah. to quell the rebellion in Chihuahua. But the intermediation is you know, it remains to be seen, you know, that is money that is spent in Chihuahua, not in Mexico City. So to what extent this is something that is captured from the central of the okay. Mexico Second, City government? Se okay, we have th that situation, which is like in Nuevo León, there was uh, some horses and saddles, more than what was registered, that were provisioned by the state of Nuevo León to uh, to fight against the invasion of the Spaniards. They never got there, they, but, but they, they, they did make that, they did spend that money. So that, that, that's another, another reason. <coughs> this information, this information comes from the accounts in Mexico City. The accounts in Mexico City are not um, totally evaluated, they're, they're, they're too primitive, that, let me say that. It happens like when you, when you travel and you have to come back to your institution and you have to give, you know, like a little invoice, a receipt of what you ate or where you were lodged or whatever. And then it takes time before, it, you know, they find out that you had a few beers, so you, the, the school's not going to pay beers, so they mm -hmm. cross it out. That's what happened with the Contaduría so de Puente de Razón. It, it's not a definite not account. And it, and it never was. It, it never, and it, it was, those accounts were never completely uh, revised, except the, 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 at the beginning, the very beginning. There's a big uh, problem with, uh, the state of Occidente, which is Sonora, Sinaloa, and includes California, uh, in which most of the uh, 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 receipts, if, if, we, if we use a, a, a modern term, most of the receipts were not accepted by the ministry because they were not, uh, they were not, not that they, they were illegal, they were too informal. Okay. That's... So we should take this more than with a pinch of salt, with a yeah. sack of salt. A, a huge actually. sack of salt, yes. Uh, all all, all, understand all figures, of all figures of right. this period, uh, we have to be... It's a monopoly of salt, <laughs> we have all to the be, yeah. of the Chinese, probably. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm.